evening. I know uh, sometimes it's hard to get out to debates like these, but it's very important that we all take part in democracy. I know there was some rain earlier, but I see many people have managed to brave the weather and show up here nonetheless. So for starters, let's everybody give themselves a big hand. I would like to begin this evening with the recognition that this event is taking place on the unceded traditional territories of the Wasatic, the Lekwungen, and the Wyoming peoples. Joining us this evening are candidates from the three provincial parties who will be hoping to represent this riding of Oakley Gordon Head in the BC Legislature after the election in May. I would like to, to uh, take the opportunity to thank and to welcome first Andrew Weaver, leader of the BC Green Party, incumbent member for the riding. Welcome, sir. Bryce Casper, Andy P. Candidate for the West. And finally, a big welcome to Alex Dutton, representing the BC Liberal Party. Thank you. We will begin this debate by offering each of the candidates an uninterrupted five minute segment in which they will introduce themselves and speak to why they feel they would be the best choice for voters in this riding. The order of responses has been selected by a random draw. After the introductions have been concluded, we will then move on to a focused questioning portion of the debate. The questions that our candidates will answer this evening were written collaboratively by members of the University of Victoria Student Society. These questions have been grouped into three broad categories. Those categories are number one, post-secondary education, number two, jobs in the economy, and number three, social services. Each of these three segments will begin with a general question put to all three candidates in a random order. They will each be given three minutes to respond. Then we will move to what we call cyclical debate, control debate. That consists of three questions, focused questions, put randomly to a candidate with another candidate randomly assigned at the chance to respond. The initial response time will be two minutes. The rebuttal time will be capped at 90 seconds. Now, in the interests of fair debate and in the interests of discouraging personal attacks against any of the candidates or any of the parties, I, as the moderator, in my judgment, uh, can reserve the opportunity to grant an extra 60 second rebuttal for anybody who might need to respond directly to anything that has been said about them. For example, if, say, the NDP candidate is talking with the Green candidate and the BC Liberal Party or the BC Liberal candidate is mentioned, that would mean that there would be an opportunity generated for Alex Dutton, the Liberal candidate, to respond, just as an example, in the interests of fairness. My job is to politely but firmly remind the candidates not to exceed their allotted time. Uh, once each of our three general topics has been exhausted, each candidate will be permitted five minutes to make a closing statement. That order also randomly chosen. Following closing statements, we will use the remainder of our time to take questions from you, the audience. We ask that any questions directed at the candidates be respectful and not exceed 15 seconds in length. If either of those conditions are not met, the question will not be taken, and we will move to the next person in line. Now that we have all that out of the way, I would like to say thank you very much, all of you, for coming here. And without further ado, I would like to introduce the first candidate that we selected before we started this by random appointment, a candidate that will be delivering their introduction first. That is candidate two, Bryce Casabin. Go ahead, sir. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. My name is Bryce. I am running in the riding of Oak Bay Gordon Head for the BC NDP. Some of you may know me as the former BC Conservation Officer who did, uh, was in the BC media for my decision regarding two bear cubs. For those of you who don't know uh, the other part of my background and story, I served for six years in the Canadian Forces uh, with the military police and I was also attached to an infantry unit uh, overseas. I've served in Afghanistan as well as here abroad in various um, emergency assistance planning roles. Coming back from overseas, I joined the BC Public Service as a conservation officer uh, where I served for two years. And I currently work as a public servant with the Ministry of Forest and I'm on political leave to seek this run for office. <coughs> I'm here because I believe there is a change needed in this province. I believe that we need to build a better BC for all of our society here. We need a government that works for our people, that has a capacity to care for the citizens in this province. A government that is focused 
not just on corporations and the wealthy, but on the average citizen. I'm looking for your support, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Candidates are not required to take the entire uh, five minutes that they've been allotted. You're welcome to continue, sir. It's your five minutes to use as you see fit. If not, you can relinquish it, and we'll, we'll move on to the next person. All right, so we will move on now. A five-minute introduction to our next candidate. It will be Alex Duffy, chosen by Brent. Thank you, Adam. Thank you to both my candidates for being here today. <coughs> my name is Alex Dutton, and I'm proud to be the BC Liberal candidate in Oak Bay Gordon Head. I was born right here in the riding. I was born at Royal Jubilee Hospital, where my father chose to work in a public system for his entire medical career. And it was the same place that we shared the last few laughs with my mother before she passed away from cancer. I grew up right here. I swam, I learned to swim at Oak Bay Rec, I played rugby at Windsor Park, I played community field hockey at UVic. And I remember in 1994, one of the most, at the time, devastating things in my life happened. My sister, my older sister, graduated from high school and told me she couldn't stay in British Columbia because there was nothing available for her here. There were no opportunities. And she left. She moved to Toronto, and she went to school there. And in 1999, I hoped maybe she was going to come back. And no, she again had to tell me that she wasn't coming back to British Columbia, even though she wanted to, because there were no opportunities for her here. And that was the beginning of how I became involved in politics. In 2001, I worked on a BC Liberal campaign, and I got hired, and I made coffee, and I photocopied, and it was incredible. And I'm proud to say that in 2011, after huge work that's been done by this party, and the huge increase in economic development and jobs, my sister was able to come back to British Columbia. And she was able to come back here because the economy is doing well. And she works in the tech sector. And that is something that we can be extremely proud of. For the last six years, I've been practicing law in Victoria. I've been coaching debating, I've been volunteering in various organizations, I've been training for races, I've been doing hill repeats up Mount Dub. I've been put to shame by some of the senior citizens working out at uh, Gordon Head Rec, who I have to say are an inspiration. And when it came time to look at this election, I became involved again, because I'm increasingly concerned about the polarization, the all or nothing attitude, that we see in the debate about environment, the environment, and the economy. I grew up as a younger British Columbian, I can still say that, I think, <laughs> caring about the environment. I helped implement the recycle program at my school. We bugged our parents to turn off the lights. The environment is not something that is foreign to me, and it's not something that is ever far from top of mind. But I've been door knocking since December. And there are a number of people in this community who want to have a conversation about other things in the environment. They too want to protect the environment, and they too believe that in order to have a sustainable economy, you need to have a sustainable environment. But they also want to talk about things like healthcare. And they want to know that despite having the best cancer outcomes in Canada, that when their parent needs the system and needs to have excellent and compassionate care that was provided to my mother, that that system is going to be there for them. And that is only possible with a strong economy. And that is only possible with planning and prudence and responsibility. To make a series of unfunded promises, the question you have to ask yourself is, are you going to pay for it, or are you going to make your children pay for it? That is the only question. All of these things what we're going to talk about over the next two hours, and I'm going to tell you about the records of the BC Liberal Party. They're all possible because of a strong and diversified economy. We are now the envy of every province in Canada. I believe that governments should help people reach their potential on their terms, and that to do that in a responsible and strategic way has been what the BC Liberal governments have done. I am proud to be running as the BC Liberal candidate <coughs> in Oak Bay Gordon Head 
and I look forward to speaking with you over the next two hours and over the next 48 days to earn your vote. Thank you, Alex Stone. Now, five minute introductory segment to you, Amber Weaver. Uh, thank you. And thank you to the UPS and the UBSS for hosting the event today. It's so important that we engage our, our youth in our democratic institutions because, frankly, uh, it's far too many decisions are being made today that have the best interests of the decision makers, first and foremost, rather than the next generation who will live the consequences of the decisions being made. So my name is Andrew Weaver. I'm the MLA, the sitting MLA for Oak Bay Gordon Head and the leader of the BC Green Party. My history is that I was born in Victoria, actually in the same Jubilee Hospital as, as my colleague uh, Alex there, but a few years prior to her. Uh, and <laughs> my parents uh, live in Victoria. My father was a professor at the University here. My mother went to the University of Victoria. My sister went to the University of Victoria. I went to the University of Victoria. My daughter is at the University of Victoria. My mother went to the University of Victoria. I met my wife at the University of Victoria. <laughs> and I have been a professor at the University of Victoria since 1992. My wife is also from Victoria, and we came back to Victoria from Montreal, where I was faculty at McGill, because we felt that first and foremost, our top priority was to have a family that grew up in a beautiful province that we were born into, and have, be surrounded by grandparents. And so we've been very, uh, very uh, blessed to have our children grow up in a, in, a, in a loving family environment with both sets of grandparents here. You know, I went to high school in the writing. My daughter went to a different high school in the writing. I graduated from Oak Bay in 1979. My son graduated from a different high school in the riding. I grew up in the Oak Bay part of the riding. I too played rugby at Windsor Park with Oak Bay High and, and, and the University of Victoria after that. And I live now in Gordon Head and have coached soccer there for many, many years. This is my home. This is where I was born. This is where I grew up. This is where my children were born. This is where my wife was born. And this is part of who we are, the riding of Oak Bay Gordon Head. It has been a distinct honor for the last four years to serve the people of Oak Bay Gordon Head in the legislature. And I would put my record up against any other MLAs to show that I have worked for you, the people of Oak Bay Gordon Head, and not only you, but for so many other British Columbians who have felt left out of the political system, who felt they had no voice in the dysfunctional environment that is our legislature, where we have two parties who've literally been fighting the same battles since the early 1990s. In fact, frankly, some of those MLAs have been in the legislature since the 1990s, and it's time for a change. We have a really exciting platform that's being built and being slowly released as the BC Green Party. Today I had the distinct honor of releasing our new economy platform in Vancouver where we talked about in, uh, our, our plans to, to engage the tech sector, the biomedical sector, the biotech sector in a way that actually builds on our strengths. Now the BC Liberals approach to the tech sector is to fund those who already have the money to give $100 million to venture cap firms that may or may not invest in BC. I'm not sure what the BC NDP plan is because they haven't really come up with a strong plan. The BC Green plan is to recognize that innovation starts at the lab bench. Innovation starts in the dorm. And what we announced today is measures to actually incentivize those who have the ideas to build on existing programs that the federal government puts forward, to, to match those programs, to ensure that they have money to bring the knowledge that they're developing to the marketplace. It's been a beginning of a journey for me. If you'd asked me five years ago if I thought I would actually ever end up being an MLA, I would have said to you no. But the reason why I ran five years is that I could no longer look my students in the face at the University of Victoria. I could no longer look to them on the issue of climate change that I taught for many years and say to them when they ask, what can we do? And I would say that there's several things. One is, you know, you use your, your pocketbook to guide the market, and two is get engaged in our democratic institutions. And they would say to me, but all politicians are corrupt. They're all the same. They're in it for themselves. They just want the pensions. And I would say, no, that's not true. And if you don't like who's running, stand up as a matter of principle and run yourself. And they would say, no, 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 it's not going to do it. And I'm giving that lecture, actually, again, this week at the University of Victoria in the in EOS 365. And it's the same lecture I've given for, for many years. It's a lecture where after enough, I'm giving it enough times, I realize that I need to take a look in the mirror. If I truly want to practice what I preach, I should put my name forward. And I put my name forward for a party that had never elected anyone before in any riding, in any province in Canada, as a point of principle. 
And it's been a distinct honour for four years. And I have seen the support of our party surge across the province as we have announced candidate after candidate with exceptional credentials who, like me, are standing up not so much for the political career of politics, but because they want to reclaim our democracy for the people of British Columbia, because first and foremost, we are elected to serve you, the people, not our corporate donors, not our big labor union funders, but the people of British Columbia, and that is not happening in the legislature today. Thank you. that they need 
to actually be, be a proactive in our citizenship. We know that the federal liberals have this as a policy. We know that PEI, Quebec, and Northern European countries are doing, going this direction, and that is the direction the BC Greens will head through the introduction of initially pilot type studies, but merging into uh, more and more as we move forward. The reason we, when we talk about issues facing students, like poverty, like debt, the question we should be asking is not how do we get them into, out of debt, it's why are they in debt in the first place? And that is the approach we take in each and every policy that we put forward, is we don't just think about the quick fix, we ask why are we there in the first place? For example, we'll talk about fentanyl, and it'll be the same thing there. The government approach is reactionary. It's always, we have a problem, let's fix it. I'm not sure what the NDP approach is. Our approach is say, what got us to the problem in the first place? And then let's actually go back and treat the reason why we got there. And it'll be like that in post-secondary education, through our housing platform that we'll announce, through our education platform, that you'll see is not putting post-secondary education in isolation from other aspects of education. Education doesn't stop at grade 12 or stop when you graduate. Education is a lifelong uh, learning process, and that is going to be the focus of our platform. Thank you. Bryce Castman, same question, three minutes. Thanks, Adam. I'd just like to first uh, correct the record here. Uh, the NDP has spoken on the tech sector uh, investment, and I'd encourage both of my colleagues to uh, review our platform initiatives uh, on that matter. Uh, as far as education, I'm also happy to answer the question uh, of my colleague of how, how we got here and what the problem is. Tuition's out of control. It's too high. Students are paying for it out of their own pockets and incurring debt as a result. We need a properly funded education system. Not, not just for the wealthy that can afford access to a quality education, but for all British Columbians. And I know this because I'm the only one on the panel currently paying for my tuition. So I'm in the doctoral program at Royal Roads, and it is expensive, and it is hard to raise a family. I've been fortunate enough to achieve government employment, uh, graduating out of my master's degree, but unlike many British Columbians who, who aren't uh, fortunate enough to get a good paying job, uh, even I still find it difficult to pay these tuition bills. So we need a government that is looking out for all British Columbians, that is providing affordable education. We know that an educated population contributes to a better economy, a more sustainable economy. And that's what, that's what I'm here. I'm here to help build a better BC that looks out for the people, that works for the people. Thank you. Now move into the targeted questions and cyclical debate. We have randomly chosen candidate two, Bryce Gassman, will be the first person to respond to this question. Andrew Weir, you have randomly selected to give a rebuttal of what Mr. Gassman says to say, or what he says. <laughs> yeah, I can't even talk. I have one job, and I'm not doing this. Excuse me, I'm going to read it. It's a job as a media, no less. Oh, well, I, mean, I know, right? It's, yeah, only they have a special one. Um, okay. No, I didn't see that, so. I'm just kidding. Uh, oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, all right, here's the first question. In 2005, the BC government implemented a 2% cap on annual tuition increases. This cap has faced contentious pressure from university administrators who would like to see more flexibility around it, including an increase. Bryce Casavan, what is your party's stance on the 2% cap, and how would you respond to the pressure to change it? You have two minutes, sir. So we have a costed platform uh, that is yet to come out, uh, and this this issue will most likely be addressed more holistically in that in that platform that will be coming out shortly after the writ is dropped. But listen, access to affordable education is a problem. Tuition costs currently are a problem, and they're out of control. And it is hard for students to afford the education that is needed to enter the workforce, to come out of the workforce debt-free and be able to raise a family and find affordable housing. So these, these are the issues that I want to advocate for uh, with the party that I represent. And that's what I'm looking for. This is what we need to build a better BC. We need affordable education. We need tuition that is reasonable. And we need a government that cares enough about our student body and about our economy to take the progressive steps that are needed. Thank 
you. As we too will be outlining in more specific details the actual uh, education platform. Suffice it to say that uh, university administrators would like to put pressure on tuition. As somebody who's worked at a university for, for actually almost 30 years now, uh, there's been a lot of growth in ASP, and actually being the, the union uh, leader of our union here on campus. Um, there's actually growth in university in areas other than its original mandate. And what has happened in universities uh, through the corporatization of the, of the university system is that we've seen a growth of management and a growth of bureaucracy like never before. Uh, I do not think it is appropriate, and the BC Greens do not think it is appropriate, for students to, burden, to be burdened with the cost of a burgeoning administration that has not got itself under control. This is a, an, a, 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 an approach that we'll, we'll take. It's an approach that will ensure that money is used for where it's supposed to be used, which is education. And so you'll see us actually improve, not only uh, put a, a, a cap on um, tuition fees, uh, or rather uh, talk, about, but talk about access based on need space. It is incautionable that in a modern society, we have put in place a barrier to education based on your social economic status. That is wrong in a strong, vibrant Western democracy. The BC Greens believe that is wrong, and we'll take steps to ensure that that is dealt with. <coughs> During the introduction, these questions were all written collaboratively by representatives of the University of Victoria Student Society. We didn't know who would be taking which question until we randomly drew numbers right before the debate. Our next question reads, in 2012, the BC government launched Canada's first publicly funded open textbook project through the provincially funded agency, BC Campus. Uh, the question is, what is your party's stance on the program and how will your government encourage the adoption of open educational resources? We randomly drew Alex Dutton to answer this question about how she feels about the BC Liberal program. She has two minutes to answer and to rebut her will be Bryce Tessman. Thank you, Adam. The Open Textbook Initiative is an example of the innovation in post-secondary affordability that I was speaking about earlier. This province was the first province to engage in open textbooks, and that has helped 30,000 students save $3.7 million. Now that's only 170 textbooks, and we're hoping that there can be more. However, our government is also respectful of the independence of professors to choose the materials with which they want to teach, and does not want to overstep that bound. That said, we are very proud that, produced, uh, that we pursued open textbooks and we will continue to support post-secondary institutions who want to pursue that. Thank you. Uh, Bryce Gaston, for about 90 seconds, sir. It's not enough. Textbooks are not enough. It's a drop in the bucket. Educational resources change with the times and with technology. In my current studies, I need access to a whole host of journals just to pass, not just textbooks. And the cost of those journals is, is what's not being addressed. And it's also one of the leading costs of, of current student debt and high tuition rates. We need a government that is looking at open source access to journals and textbooks, not just textbooks. The textbook, the, the investment into this textbook initiative is not enough. And I want to advocate for a, a more holistic approach to providing open access to all the resources that are needed to receive a high quality education that can help people enter the workforce and provide to our economy here in British Columbia. Thank you. Our next question will be put to Andrew Weaver, with Alex Seven given a chance to rebut. The question reads, the phase reduction of $50 million in core funding announced in BC Budget 2013 has had a noticeable impact on the ability of colleges and universities to provide services that promote student success and well-being, especially in the area of support for mental health and for sexualized violence. How would your party provide resources and funding for support services for both mental health and sexualized violence? Andrew Weaver, two minutes. Thank you. Well, first off, the reason why every, every post-secondary institution in the province of British Columbia is now required to have a sexualized violence and policies uh, and, and misconduct policy is because of a private member's bill I bought in the legislature last session. It's a direct consequence. both constituents and others in British Columbia raising the issue uh, first and foremost to me. The first step in dealing with that, the very first step of course, is getting administration to recognize that there's a problem. 
And the reason why historically that's been, been difficult is because all universities want to be branded as safe places for students to go. So the first step is recognition. The second step is, is targeted funding. So how will we do it? The way, the way you would do it is, number one, get administration to recognize. I think they are, based on that policy. The next thing to do is to get them to prioritize, ultimately, the monies that they get for student service, services. And that is also beginning to happen in, in terms of policies with respect to sexualized violence and misconduct. We have a long way to go to on mental health. Uh, one of the things that we will be doing as we release our platform is, is putting forward our ideas as to how we can pro pro expand mental health services in the <coughs> province of British Columbia, not only for post-secondary institution, but throughout our society. You know, we'll talk about the fentanyl crisis, but what we're not, we're talking about dealing with the fentanyl crisis. We're reacting. We're not talking about recovery and why people got there in the first place. So as you see in our platform as we release it, it will be focused on prevention and recovery and not only focused on the short term. So you'll see a mental health platform released in the days and months and weeks ahead. Thank you. Alex, you have 90 seconds of Thank you. As a young woman who uh, has been on campus and dealt with sexualized violence, I can tell you firsthand that every campus should have a policy on sexualized violence. And I applaud Mr. Weaver for his initiative. <coughs> I further applaud the BC Liberal government for recognizing the independent voice that was raised and adopting that and saying, yes, we do need to require all post-secondary <laughs> a sexualized violence policy by May 20th. I personally would like to go one step further and see that there is a further review about the nature of the education provided in secondary school and high schools around consent to make sure that it is contextualized appropriately in an age of digital media and in an age of alcohol and drugs where we see kids experimenting with those earlier and earlier. I think the issue of sexualized violence on campus is of course important. I think no one up here is going to suggest that it is appropriate or that supports are currently adequate. But I think the question is broader and I think the question needs to include that, that secondary piece, that high school level discussion about consent. And I fundamentally believe that we can fix this problem, and I appreciate Mr. Weaver bringing it to the fore. That concludes our first talk. Thank you all of our candidates. <laughs> Moving on, our next section is Jobs and the Economy. The order in which we have randomly selected the response for our first broad question will be Alex Duff and Weaver, Bryce Casavant. The question is, if elected, what sectors of the economy would your party focus on to drive the creation of viable employment opportunities for recent post-secondary graduates? Once again, all three candidates given three minutes to respond to this, the same question. We begin with Alex Duff. Thank you. In 2011, the British Columbia government produced the BC Jobs Plan, and its focus was to diversify the economy, including diversifying the different sectors, well-paying sectors, that could provide jobs for post-secondary students. In 2012, prior to Mr. Weaver's election, we introduced the first tech strategy. And the reason that we did that was because we know that tech is going to help us have cleaner energy. It's going to help us do things more efficiently. It is where the future is going. That is not in dispute. Based on the job strategy in 2011, we've, we've seen the diversification of the economy. And based on the tech strategy in 2012, we know that there are more than 100,000 British Columbians that are currently involved in the tech sector. Those initiatives are only part. They are part, and I bring them up as an example, of the strategic long-term leadership that this government has offered. Specifically, we have seen investments, and will continue to see investments in aerospace, in the 50 life science centers that have spun off more than 100 companies, in pharmacare, uh, pharmaceutical and medical manufacturing, these are jobs that require, that pay well. These are jobs that mean that we have a diversified economy and that we can go forward to the new economy where we aren't simply, we aren't simply dealing in natural resources. But we cannot mistake the fact that a huge portion of the tech sector does support natural resources and does make them more efficient and make them more useful and more sustainable. These things are diverse. These questions are complex. There is no silver bullet. But I can tell you with pride that things like the BC Jobs Plan, where it was clear the goals and clear the outcome, 
has been achieved. That record is transparent and that strategy was clear. And that is what the BC Liberal government delivered. Thank you. Without any doubt, the BC Jobs Plan has been a colossal failure. What you're not being told, what you're not being told, is those jobs are short-term, they're part-time, and they're low-paying. And in addition, the only reason why our economy is strong, it's not because of any planning by the BC Liberal government. It's because of an out-of-control, real estate, speculative market in Vancouver that led to a windfall. I stood alone saying that the LNG dream of the BC Liberals was a pipe dream. I stood alone in the BC le legislature voting against the LNG income tax regime, pointing out it was a generational sellout trying to attract an industry that would not be coming to BC. I stood alone year after year speaking out for the lost opportunities that were happening. I stood alone arguing for investment in the tech sector, I stood, despite what, what you just heard. I stood alone on so many of these issues. I stood alone when wood fiber LNG was put forward by the BC Liberals. And on the same day, the BC NDP put out a press release supporting it. An industry that will give 100 jobs. That each and every one of those jobs is subsidized to the tune of $440,000 a year. Imagine the fiscal recklessness of that approach. 440,000 taxpayers uh, dollars per job, per year, supported by both these parties to try to land a pipe dream that's not going to be happening because of a global market oversupply. That's why we outlined our, our plan for the new economy today in Vancouver. And I encourage each and every one of you to go and look at that plan. It's a realistic plan. One of our platform has been put together by some of the best and brightest in British Columbia. The riding of Oak Bay is, a, is an amazing riding to represent. A significant fraction of the civil service lives there, retired there or has moved there from other provinces. And we have put together platform teams that have built a platform, a platform to encourage innovation and creativity. That's come from the bottom up through innovation in the civil service sector and the input they've given. And I would challenge each of you to look at it because it will stand up, not like to a soundbite, not to promises of 100,000 jobs, a $1 trillion hit to the GDP, $100 billion prosperity fund, debt free BC and yada, yada, yada. This is a platform grounded in evidence, a platform that's grounded in putting people first, and a platform in grounding in setting the stage for innovation and creativity to bring prosperity to British Columbia, not only in the LNG sector, but across a diversity of fields. I'm proud of our plan, and I hope you have a chance to look at it later on bcgreens.ca. We will get a chance to respond in just a moment, but first, Alex Devon, would you like to reply to any of the points that were just made about the BC Liberal Party? Two specific things, Adam. 60 seconds, please. The Go first on. thing is it's important to remember that Statistics Canada indicates that of the 220,000 jobs that have been created in this province, 96% of them are full-time. I'm not sure where most of them are. Mr. Weaver's position is that he just said that the Green platform, which conveniently came out this afternoon and I have not had an opportunity to specifically compare it to the BC tech strategy, he says that his plan is better. It's better than the one produced by government. He has insulted, in fact, the civil servants that he just mentioned in his own speech. And I would say that the civil servants in this province and the ones that live in this constituency were absolutely invaluable in developing the BC tech sector strategy and that is why it is working. Behind you, um, Bryce Casper, thank you for waiting patiently. You, sir, have three minutes now to respond to the broad question. If elected, what sectors of the economy will your party focus on to create a viable?